Yes, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening again, and greetings from Southern California. Uh, this is Harold Ritter, and this is Election Day Plus 30 update. Yes, it's hard to believe, you know, we've gone 30 days since the election, our national election, and the results are still not clear. You know, by dragging this process out, certain time deadlines are looming just ahead. And the days seem dark, and the faith and expectation of many in this electoral process is waning. It seems perhaps the bad guys will succeed and destroy the democracy and ruin the electoral process in a nation that has been most known for this worldwide. So today we're going to look at two texts from the Bible again. Uh, one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 20, the other is in Exodus chapter 14. These were two times that the nation of Israel itself was facing utter destruction, really national extinction, and time was running out. In our election process, you know, the certification of results is looming just ahead, as well as the electoral college voting and the electing of electors that actually uh, uh, cause the election to be finalized. So this is our fourth video update about these current events. Uh, so I invite you, if you haven't had a chance to look at the other ones, you know, we're, in each video we're trying to tie what's going on today back to timeless biblical events. Uh, so if you missed an, all the others, <laughs> let's say this is your first one, uh, let's, the first one is uh, Election Day plus six, and we focus on that one on Amos 3, 7. And that's the fact that the Lord always speaks through his prophets to declare his plans and purposes in the earth. And he always does that in advance of performing them. So we believe that the prophets have spoken about this election, and there is a, there is a certainness, or certainty of what will happen. Uh, election Day plus 10 is the second video. It's based on 1 Kings chapter 1. And in this story, amazingly, uh, in Israel, there was an attempt to steal an election during the reign of David. So you might you might enjoy the parallels that are there. Um, in Election Day plus 20, which was the, our third video, we look at 1 Kings chapter 22. And this is interesting because a lying spirit, lies, liars, uh, were controlling the narrative in the ears of the king and all the people and led the nation in the wrong direction. So we invite you to uh, take a look at those. And remembering that 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it tells us that all of these things that were written and, and occurred in prior times, they're written as examples to us for and, and for our ammonition, one way to say that would be they're written for our learning, you know, so that we would know how to conduct ourselves in similar situations. So before we get started today in Second Chronicles 20, I wanted to review uh, some important background uh, understanding about what's called the covenant. You know, so the Bible itself is the Old Testament, the New Testament, and that word testamentum is a Latin word. It means covenant, you know, so we could say that the Bible itself is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So there's, a, God has always dealt with people based on covenant. So when we're looking at the Word of God, we're really looking at a book of covenant and covenants. And as, and when we see the relationship that we have with God through covenant, then we can become increasingly bold in our faith and in our prayers, and we can come confidently to the throne of grace to receive mercy and help in the time of need. So a little background, you know, about this, because I think most people today do not understand covenant. They don't know what it is. Uh, they would think of it as a contract. They would think of it as some kind of legal agreement. But covenants are much more than that. And so we have to understand what a covenant is to really understand these next two stories because the fact of covenant is why God got involved in these dramatic deliverances that we see in Exodus 14 and also in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 20. God is, in both of these texts, you know, we see God intervening in human affairs because of covenant relationship with one party and not the other. And, and I believe that's why today also that God will intervene in this election, because there's many 
in this nation and the nation as a whole has a covenant with God based on some of our founding uh, documents. You know, the Mayflower, the Mayflower Con pact was a covenant document. The Constitution itself is a covenant document. So let's just understand biblical uh, covenants, and then perhaps we'll understand uh, the covenant relationship we have with God. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 says, now the God of peace, this is Hebrews 13, verse 20 says, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the basis of the Christian faith, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So notice that term there, the blood of the everlasting covenant. So there is a covenant that is everlasting, and that is what we base our eternal life on, the fact that Jesus Christ died for us, died for the descendants of Abraham, and also for the sins of the whole world. And anyone who would believe on him, believe on Messiah Jesus, you know, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Um, Christ is the, is the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one or the Messiah. So if we'll believe on Jesus, we'll believe that he took our place on the cross and that he rose again from the dead, showing his justification, showing that the Father accepted his blood and his sacrifice for us. If we'll believe that, then we can have eternal life. And that's an everlasting covenant. You know, God's never going to change his mind. So, but what is a covenant? You know, it, it's hard to define it again. The best way to think of it is this. It's an agreement between two parties where you say, everything that you have is mine and everything I have is yours. Now, you might think of that as like a marriage, you know, like husband and wife come together and the, the two become one. But in covenant, there is a, an an there's an element where you're pledging your life. You know, like if you break covenant, you forfeit your life. Like this is a lifelong agreement that you pledge to honor. And the penalty of doing not keeping the covenant is that you would actually die. The covenant breaker deserves to die. So God has a covenant. And this is, uh, I always tell students when I teach in the Bible school on blood covenant, this is probably the most fantastic verse in the whole Bible. Hardly anyone ever talks about it. It's, it's uh, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. It says, in the same day, the same day that this event happened, uh, where Abraham was doing a covenant ceremony. He, 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 he cut animals and he, their blood was shed and they, they were split in half and he walked between the pieces. This all has to do with symbol, symbolism of cutting a covenant or creating a covenant between two parties. But it says in that day where they did a covenant ceremony, it says the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He was called Abram at the time, later changed his name to Abraham. He is the father of the Jewish nation, also the father of the Arab nations, you know, uh, through his son Ishmael. So Abraham, this great figure in history, has a covenant with God. He has a covenant relationship with God. And so when this covenant was made, the Lord said, unto your seed, I'm giving this land from the river Egypt all the way to the great river, the Euphrates. So that's quite a bit of real estate. And that has all been pledged. And how many know today that the Jewish nation doesn't occupy all of this area, but this is the pledge that God said that this is the place where I will give you and your descendants forever. God is keeping his covenant even today with Abraham, the fact that the Jewish nation exists. You know, we never hear about uh, some of the other biblical uh, peoples, you know, the Amorites and the Moabites and the Perizzites and the Jezbusites and uh, the Philistines, you know, all of these people are long extinct because they, they were not in covenant relationship with God. So the fact that the, the descendants of Abraham are still on the earth, that they still exist, is a testimony of God's covenant-keeping pledges. Now, I want you to uh, understand uh, a little bit more about this from Genesis chapter 17 now, okay? And, and we could do, and we should, uh, do a whole teaching on covenant, but I'll just, I just want to give you this high-level understanding because 
all of the stories we're going to talk about today are based on covenant. Like, because there was a covenant, something happened, okay? And I believe in our elections today that because of covenant relationship, because there's people like myself and other believers who have entered into covenant with God through Jesus Christ, okay? And you'll see here in a minute why I believe that. Genesis 17, verses 7 and 8, it says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and your seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. So notice what it's saying here is that that the descendants of Abraham will have an everlasting covenant uh, in each of their, the because if one party of the covenant is still alive, then the covenant is still in force. So here's the thing, God is eternal and he doesn't die. So this covenant that he makes with Abraham, even though Abraham's not on the earth anymore, his descendants enjoy the benefit of the covenant. And so it says, I'll be a God unto thee, unto your people, and to the your seed after you, and I will give unto them, unto you, and unto your seed after you, this land which which right now you're a stranger and you're not owning any property, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And then he implements um, in this chapter, Genesis 22. I'm sorry, Genesis 17. The covenant sign of the covenant, which was circumcision. So the, uh, the, the Israeli males were to be circumcised as a sign of their Abrahamic covenant. Now later, um, there was a testing of the covenant in Genesis 22, where, where Abraham asked, was, the Lord asked Abraham, give me your firstborn, give me your son Isaac and sacrifice him to me. Now that seems kind of weird, but it was it it states right at the beginning of that chapter that this was a test that God was testing Abraham because guess what, God wanted to be obliged to give His son to the descendants of Abraham, and of course His son is the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened is Abraham went and he fulfilled his obligation in covenant. He said, "I'm going to take my son." And how many know he went to Mount Moriah and and just as he was about to. Uh, you know, kill him on the altar. It says an angel called out from heaven and said, now I know that you fear me. Now that I know that you did not withhold from me your only son. Uh, blessing, I will bless you and increasing, I will increase you. And because you've done this thing, everyone in the world will be blessed because I will give my son for all of your descendants and all of those that connect themselves to you through faith. Amen. How does that circle back to us? It's all found in the New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. It's Galatians chapter 3, chapter 3, verses 13, 14, and also 29. Now it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the broken law, which was the law of the covenant, the Israelis had not honored it. Jesus came to fulfill it, to be the one who, who never did anything against the written command of God. So he was the perfect man, tempted in all points as we are, except without sin. And this perfect man dies for the nation. He dies so that all of the ones who had transgressed the law would be forgiven, would be set free, would have the opportunity to uh, walk in right relationship with God. And that was, typ that was typified by the Passover lamb that was sacrificed every uh, Passover. We call it Easter now. But every time that the Passover was sacrificed, that was symbolic that God would accept an innocent victim to pay for the sins of the guilty. Now, how does that affect us? It says when Christ, Christ was cursed, he, he, he hung on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. The blessing, this covenant relationship with God, could be transferred to Gentiles, those outside of covenant. Um, in other words, people that are not physical descendants of Abraham the Gentiles, okay, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then verse 29, it says, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to promise. So this is a wonderful day when we can say, 
that we know that we belong to God through Jesus Christ and all the blessings of Abraham, everything that Abraham's descendants enjoy today, even in the earth, the Jewish nation has been wildly prospered and wildly preserved and protected throughout all time. This, this same uh, parental relationship where God is our father and we are his children is, is extended to us who believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. So, when you have a covenant relationship, and here's the key thing, you, can, you have the right to ask for things from your covenant partner. You have the right to ask for anything from your covenant partner. Now, I'm married, so technically my wife has full right to um, every dollar that's in our bank account and every piece of equipment or any book or DVD or the cars in the driveway. She has full right to those through covenant. OK, they're they're not mine and hers. They're ours. Right. So we're in covenant together and she has as much right to them as I do. In First Corinthians uh, 1032, I want you to see this here because it's important to distinguish that how God looks at things. OK, in this is so important. Uh, First Corinthians 1032, it says, give none offense. Don't give any offense to neither to the Jew nor the Gentile, nor the Church of God. Now, this was a big verse because this shows the three ways that God sees every person. You're either a Jew, a physical descendant of Abraham. You're either a Gentile, and I'll define that in a moment. You know, So the, the Jews are the descendants of Abraham through Sarah. The Abraham, um, there's also descendants of Abraham. Um, Abraham through Hagar, which those are known as Arab people, and they have uh, they have also a covenant to be greatly enlarged. I think there's a billion Muslims in the world today. Uh, Gentiles um, typically don't have a relationship with God. Okay, in Ephesians two, verse twelve, it says, "At that time you were without Christ," and this is what we were. When we weren't saved, when we weren't born again, when we weren't in the family of God, when we hadn't been adopted, when we didn't believe on Jesus, when we didn't know about Jesus, when we were just lost, it says, there was a time you were without Christ and you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You weren't connected to the nation. And it says, you were strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no access to God through covenant. It says, you were without hope or having no hope and without God in the world, having no hope and without God in the world. And then it goes on to say how God changed that and brought us nigh or brought us close through Jesus Christ. So if you're in him, if you're in Christ, if you believe in Messiah, then you have access to God. But formerly, Gentiles didn't. And, and today, everyone who's not believing in Christ is classified in the mind of God as a Gentile. So he's only thinking about Jews, Gentiles and the church. Now, finally, the church is important because this is the bride of Christ. This is the group that is connected through to Jesus through love. You know, that he loved us. He first loved us and we respond to his love just like a man and a woman respond to each other. A, a man loves his wife and then his wife responds to that love. When we see that kind of transaction, that's a picture of what's happened with Jesus and his Gentile bride, his, his uh, guhim bride, his, his non-Jewish bride, you know. So he took, a pe he took a people that were not a people and he brought them close to himself. And thank God for his great love for us. Amen. So the church has covenant, okay? We, and this is, you know, we started with the scripture in um, Hebrews chapter uh, 13, verse 20, the blood of the everlasting covenant. So the church has covenant. So we could say this, the church has access and the right to ask and demand things. The church has access and the right to ask and demand things. And this is where we have to remember today is that we are, you know we're we're not cut off from God, okay? We're not we're not um, outside of covenant, but we are connected now. You know, 
in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Hebrews 4, 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us come boldly that we may obtain mercy and help in the time of need. And this is the posture. You know, I'm talking about the election, even though I'm filling in all this background understanding, because we need access to God right now. We need to be able to call on him the way in, a, in very critical times, because today and because of these events, this is a very critical time. And we need to know that we have access to him. We have confident access. And, and it says we can come boldly to the throne of grace and make our petitions and say, Lord, we're in covenant with you. This is, there's covenant people in this nation. This nation was founded on a covenant with you. And Father, we're expecting you, to, we're uh, demanding, really, that you would move on our behalf. And we're expecting you, and we're thanking you in advance for that. We're, we're saying, Father, you, only you can fix this. And we're ex all our eyes are on you. Amen? Now, let's go back and look at um, the stories that I referenced here earlier um, in Second Chronicles 20 and also in Exodus uh, 14. Now, I want to talk first about the time of the Exodus when the Israeli nation had gone down into Egypt. This was um, the descendants uh, of, of uh, Jacob had come down and they had, uh, they had 70 of them came down into Egypt uh, into Israel, excuse me, came into Egypt and they began to multiply. And now estimates are there's 2 million Jews. This is 400 years later. Okay. So they've had a lot of children. They've multiplied. And now they're a nation within a nation. You know, this Jewish nation, a powerful nation is inside of the Egyptian nation. And the Egyptians have recognized them as a threat and they've they've reduced their status in society to slavery, and uh, the Bible talks about they were subjected to hard labor and rigor. And it says that as this was going on in uh, after 400 years, um, it says that their cry, the cry of the Israelis, the Jews, came up to God because of their bondage. This is Exodus chapter two, verses 23 to. Uh, 25, 23 to 25. Their cry came up to God because of bondage. And God heard their groanings. God heard their pleas. And, and it says here, very significant, it says, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob because that passes on to any living descendant because God is eternal. And as long as one party in the covenant is alive, then this goes on forever and ever. Amen. So his covenant that he established with Abraham to give them to the land, he remembered Isaac, he remembered Jacob, and he acknowledged the covenant. And this is the key, you know, you think about, well, why did God get involved and do, you know, split the Red Sea and bring the people out of Egypt so miraculously? Because he was obliged by covenant, okay? And now let's turn over to the other story I want to look at, because we're, we're going to look at both. You know, we'll come back to Exodus in a minute, but I just wanted to focus a little bit more on Second Chronicles right now. Because in both of these cases, there was a day where the nation was uh, threatened with complete slaughter, total destruction, and annihilation. Okay, And you might say, well, that's a little extreme, but I believe if this election doesn't go the right direction, that... Christians and our freedoms are subject to slaughter, destruction, and annihilation. This is not, uh, you know, some many people have said this is the most important election of our lifetime. But Second Chronicles chapter one, sorry, Second Chronicles chapter twenty, Second Chronicles chapter twenty, verse one. It came to pass after these days that the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, and with them others besides the Amorites. And in Psalm 83, it actually tells you the all the groups that were lined up. You know, there was quite a number of people that had come together to fight against uh, Jehoshaphat. This is uh, Jehoshaphat, now the king of, of Judah. So the groups that came against him, first of all, were Moab 
and Ammon, okay? And these are both descendants of Lot. Lot was the nephew of, of, of Abraham. When Abraham came first into the land, he brought his nephew Lot. So this is a relative, you know, this is a, you know, somebody just like us, you know? And so there's, so that's symbolic. Just keep that for a moment. And then there was another group called, um, that are in verse 10 are identified as Mount Seir. And that's spelled S-E-I-R. So Mount Seir is the old Edomite race. And these are the, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. So the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. And so, so you have actually all sorts of relatives are turning on each other. You know, you have the this distant cousins in Lot's descendants, and then you have the, the brother of Esau, the twin of Jacob, Isaac's children. Um, so Esau and Jacob, you know, the twins. So these are very close relatives, okay, but not in the not in the lineage of Israel and the covenant. They're outside the covenants, but these are the groups that are lining up, okay? And I like to say it this way, you know, <laughs> we're always comparing an ancient story with modern events, but here's, there's three adversaries today, okay? Number one is the democratic political machine, okay? There's, there's relatives and friends and people that are all around us that are connected to the democratic machine which is, at this time, an adversary to freedom, to the truth, and to the Christian um, advancement worldwide. My mother was a Democrat most of her life until recently. She realized that they had gone off the hinges. Um, my brothers are still, and, and I have many friends, that their children are involved in these organizations. Uh, that's one group. The second group is the mainstream media, uh, the modern-day Pravda, the propaganda machine, the lying left that are communicating a message that has a motive and it is not the advancement of, of freedom and f of Christianity. And then finally, there's a political establishment. This is the third group. And notice how these are all kind of all around us, kind of all related to us and some that were our friends but are no longer. The political establishment uh, known by many as the swamp. It's the professional D.C. community, the District of Columbia community. And, you know, very, very recently, you know, we heard the uh, from the Department of Justice, you know, the attorney general declares that there's no widespread election fraud. He, you know, we've we've all been hearing the last two weeks. Uh, my wife has been sitting through hearing after hearing after hearing and uh, hearing, <laughs> hearing in those hearings about mountains of fraud uh, in different states, um, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, all these different states where there's been so many irregularities. But the head of our justice in our District of Columbia in the middle of the swamp is declaring there is no widespread election fraud. So it looks hopeless. You know, it looks like there's that there's no justice, you know, we're appealing to the Department of Justice and there's no justice. Uh, the mainstream media is lying to us. The democratic machine is literally breaking the law in other, in parts, of, in, in, in parts of the country, doing things that are not supposed to be done when an election is going on. So these are our adversaries. And in verse two, it looks very dark. You know, it says, it looks like there's no way you know, verse 2, it says that there comes a great multitude against thee. That's a lot of people lined up against you. Um, you know, you've got the media, you've got this political machine, you've got career politicians, and they all seem to be looking to do something that isn't in line with the will and plan of God. Looking again at uh, verse 3, um, here it says that Jehoshaphat feared, of course, <laughs> we know why. And he set himself to seek the Lord, and he declared a fast. They declared a fast in the nation, a national time of fasting and prayer. Now, I, I believe that several months ago, a lot of people were moved to uh, do fasting and prayer to, in preparation for this election. And I believe that was necessary 
at that time. Uh, I don't think that's the season we're in right now. You'll see later. But they did it for the purpose of humbling themselves and asking for God's assistance. In verse 4, it says, Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Amen. So they knew that God was their only answer. And so they they didn't try any natural things. They just said, we've got to get on our face. We've got to pray. We've got to ask the Lord. Amen. Now, it's interesting now in verse uh, 6, it says, now Jehoshaphat is actually leading the prayer. He's appealing to God. And he says, O Lord God of our fathers, are thou not God in heaven? And do, do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Are not thou our God, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, talking about when Joshua went in and took the land, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, and notice this term, thy friend forever. Abraham, thy friend forever. Now, what he's doing here in using this word friend, you know, when we hear the word friend, we just think, oh, you know, he's my friend, she's my friend. But the word friend in the Bible is reserved only to Abraham. And it, it implies the, uh, the person who is in covenant with God. It's not just uh, a casual term. When you see the word friend or friendship in the Bible, it's talking about people that are in a covenant relationship with one another. So when, when uh, Jehoshaphat is praying, he's reminding God, hey, Abraham has a covenant with you and we're he, yours, we're Abraham's seed and he has a covenant with you. So they're appealing to covenant. They're appealing to the fact that Abraham uh, has a special and unique relationship with God. So that was the basis of their prayer is Abraham's your friend and we're the descendants. So you need to take uh, start looking out uh, what's going on here because you made a promise to Abraham and you're a covenant keeping God. Um, so that is the basis of the appeal. Uh, this term friend is also used in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 talking about how God called Abraham alone and blessed him and increased him. Now some will say that also Moses was called a friend of God and that is true but the word friend there is a different word, okay? It's actually the word for a neighbor. You know, he was a near one. He was one nearby God. You know, he, he spent time with God. But the word friend here for Abraham is actually only uniquely uh, used of him. It's also in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, where it says, I called Abraham alone, and I prospered him, and I increased him. Amen? You know, so God had a special relationship with Abraham, and only Abraham is called the friend of God. Until we get to the New Testament, then guess what? The Bible says that we're all the friends of, or Jesus calls us friends, you know, and because he's in covenant with us through his own blood, you know, that's why we take communion. We celebrate the covenant that Jesus extended to us, that he, he said, I'm not, I'm going to go beyond one man and one nation and one descendants. I'm going to open this up to all people. Whoever believes can become the children of God. And so we have a wonderful access that is uniquely enjoyed by the descendants of Abraham. So the friend of God is a significant term. So and the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, Jehoshaphat wisely uh, appeals to covenant. He says, we have a covenant. Don't you remember? We're the descendants of Abraham. And uh, just like in Exodus, you know, God remembered the covenant, okay? And now here, the basis of the prayers of Jehoshaphat is covenant. He's saying, Lord, in verse 12, it says, he talks about all of these nations that are coming against them. And he says, you know, did we not spare them, you know, when we were coming into the land? Didn't you tell us, you know, leave the Amorites alone, leave the Moabites alone, leave the uh, inhabitants of Matsir alone? Didn't you uh, forbid us from attacking them? And look how they return 
our the the goodness and the favor that we showed them look they're coming to attack us they're even joining up together to attack us you know and they so he's he's appealing and he's saying lord look at this look what they're doing in verse 12 he says oh god will you not judge them will you not judge between us and them will you not will not the judge of the whole world do rightly won't you make this right and I believe that's the basis of our prayers right now to God about the election. Lord, won't you make this right? Won't you stop this ridiculous uh, level of corruption and um, literally stealing <laughs> stealing votes and stealing uh, results? Lord, won't you change this? Won't you intervene? It says, um, verse 12, we have no might against this great company. We can't, we can't, you know, individually as the church, we can't take on the democratic po political machine, the media. We can't take on uh, the corruption that's in D.C. We can't do that, Lord. We have no might against this company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. So he's appealing to that. He's appealing to God based on covenant. And that was the significance of uh, verse verse 7, that we have a covenant. They had a covenant, okay? And they began to, to cry out. Now, let's see what happens in verse 15. It says, it says, well, it actually starts in verse 14. It says, then, <laughs> then the Spirit of God came upon a man, and a man spoke, okay? That's that's really the essence of our election day plus six message, you know, that God speaks through his prophets. He speaks through his men to declare his will and purpose at a time. But it says here in um, verse 14, it says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jehael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, and just so you know exactly who this guy is, um, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. So the Spirit of God came on him to, to speak through him. And he said, Hearken all you inhabitants of Judah and all you inhabitants of, of Jerusalem and, and also King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord unto you. How many want to hear what God says? Be not afraid, and be not dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it is the Lord's. Tomorrow go down against them, and behold, they will come up by the cliff of Zis. You know, it's interesting. He says, I know exactly where they are. I know exactly what they're doing. And here's what I want you to do. Go out to where they are. And he says, verse 17, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand. And how many know that that's what we were saying in the first video? There's a time where we need to stand. We need to stand on what's been said to us. We need to stand on a foundation of faith that we've heard from God. We know that this election is not going to be stolen. It's not going to be taken away. But we are going to stand and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Amen. So the people were instructed to go out against them. And it says they rose, uh, starting in verse um, 19, it says they, they, they came together and they put the Levites and the Korahites, they stood up to praise the Lord God with a loud voice. And they went out in the morning, verse 20, that's our theme verse for the election. It says, uh, believe in the Lord your God, so you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Amen. Uh, we went over that, I think, every video, particularly plus six. But when he, he consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and said, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise... When they began to sing and praise, when they began to sing and praise, when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and they were smitten. Actually, they began to fight against each other. Moab attacked Ammon, and then Mount Seir attacked them, and they, there was infighting. 
I wonder if that will happen here, that as the church begins to praise and go, begins to praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. L praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Praise God that his mercy endures forever. Praise God that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he doesn't forsake his people. He won't let us down at the last minute. That even in the, the day where uh, the opposition is right in our face, he'll be there and that, that he, will, he will deliver us. Amen. Now let's go quickly to um, Exodus 14, you know, because this in this story, uh, it, some of you may know it, some of you may not, you know, but the story is that the, Isra the Israelis were, they were forced out of Egypt. It was the night of the Passover when the Passover lamb was uh, killed and the blood was put on the on the doorposts of all the Israeli homes. And inside, those that were under the blood, death passed over. And they, there was no dead in the Israeli homes. But in every home in Egypt, the firstborn died. And so there was death in every family. And so what they said was, they, after that, they wanted the Egyptians wanted all the Israelis to get out of the country. So they, they immediately left and they fled into the desert. And they, were, they went out, uh, they went south, and they came up against an area where the Red Sea uh, was, they were right at the border of the Red Sea, and they were south of Egypt. Well, a few days later, Pharaoh decided that he had made a mistake. And he wanted those Egyptians back. So he ordered his army to go and chase them. And all his chariots and all his horsemen and all of his military was sent to get this group of slaves and bring them back to Egypt. So this army goes out to get the Israeli people. The Israeli people are, are camped next to the sea. And they begin to see all these horses and ch chariots coming towards them. And that, <laughs> another very dramatic moment, uh, and Moses says to the people, this is Exodus 14, 13, he says, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, what he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see no more forever. For the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. You'll stop, in other words, stop talking about them killing you. You know, the few verses before this, they were like, we're going to die out here. We should have just stayed in Egypt. He said, stop it. Stop talking unbelief. Stop talking that this election is never going to turn around and that, you know, the attorney general doesn't even recognize any fraud is happening and all the media is saying there's nothing going on and they've already declared a winner and that winner is not the one we think actually won. We have to stop talking doubt and unbelief. We have to start praising God. And so Moses said, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of God. See what God's going to do for you. Amen. And, it's, and you may know the story then, but, you know, God splits the Red Sea. And the, the people walk through the sea on, on dry ground. He splits the, the Red Sea and all two million people walk to the other side, the Sinai Peninsula. And then it says that the Egyptians tried to also go through the Red Sea. And it said at that moment, as they tried to do it, it says the wheels of their chariots began to come off. I believe the wheels of the progress of the left and those that are attempting to steal this election will soon start to come off. The wheels of their progress will start to come off. And they will be swept up in the flood of God's greatness because what happened is as the, their chariots began to get stuck in the sea then the walls of the sea collapsed down on them and the the, Israel, uh, the Egyptians were seen no more the enemy's uh, plans will not prosper i'll just leave you with these two things you know in in exodus 14:31 it says when israel saw the great work that god did upon the egyptians the people feared the lord and believed the Lord and his servants. They feared, the people feared the Lord. And this is what I think is going to happen in the next few days. There's going to be a reverential fear of God that's going to fall on this nation. A reverential fear of God will fall on people. And they will begin to see, you know what? God did this. God turned the, the captivity. 
God turned the captivity, and we are as those that laughed. We are as those that we serve a great God. And people, the fear of God will fall on this nation as it has not in many, many years. And it'll be a great opportunity for the church. Uh, we also saw this in Second Chronicles uh, 20 and verse 29. This is 2029. It says, And the fear of God was on all the nations when they heard what had happened and how the Lord fought, fought against the enemies of Israel. So the Lord came against Moab, Ammon, and Manseah. And when that happened, it caused fear to fall upon all the people who observed what was going on. As we said last time, you know, it's good to pray. And I, I believe there was a time we needed to pray and ask God to intervene. But I believe he's heard our prayers. He's declared his will. And it's not a time to keep praying and praying and praying and praying and begging and praying. Because beggars, believers don't beg. Amen. Believers believe. Amen. And so if we believe, then a corresponding action is to praise. It's time to praise the Lord. You know, because there's been so many, there's been so many prayers that the, the, the scales are, you know, if you have a, the balance scales, you know, prayer, 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 prayer. No, it's time for praise, 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 praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise him for what he's doing. Praise him for that he, this circumstances are not beyond him, okay? Praise him for his greatness. Praise him for his might. Amen. And as one person said, you know, it's time to eat cake. It's time to celebrate. Amen. You know, I believe that my God is bigger than the people who are trying to steal this election. I believe that this nation, this country has a covenant with God. Amen. And there are, and certainly within it are people who have a covenant with God, the church, and also the Jews. So we have we have a right to access God and for to ask Him and to worship Him. Amen. So I believe uh, I believe these things are going to turn very quickly. I believe we're going to see the greatness of the hand of God. Amen. As one pastor said, God is rolling up His sleeves. The Lord Jesus is 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 a king. He is a, a victor. He is a warrior. Amen. And the host of heaven is standing by to, uh, to enforce his plan and his will and his, his matters in, in the affairs of men. Amen. So Father, we thank you that we can count on you. We thank you that we never have to uh, do without good because of your great mercy and your great love. So Father, thank you for changing what's going on, uh, causing things to be revealed, causing things to come out. And Father, that what we're hearing now, sir, very soon, we will never hear again. We'll never hear the lies. We'll never hear the deceptions, Father. But we'll hear the truth. And that in the end, you will conquer and that you'll bring about your will and plan and purpose in this nation. In Jesus' name, amen.